Could you solve a question like this in less than a minute? Or how about this one? People with a high IQ can typically solve problems such as these faster than most other people. Having a high IQ basically means that you have better cognitive skills compared to others, such as recognizing patterns or learning new concepts quickly. This is why we often refer to IQ as a measure of cognitive intelligence. Is IQ genetic? Is it something that you're just born with? There is some evidence that IQ is largely genetic, uh, based on a study that looked at identical twins who grew up separately. What this study found was that even when these identical twins grew up separately, they still had similar IQs. This suggests that genes do in fact play a large role. But we also know now about neuroplasticity, basically that your brain is constantly rewiring itself through learning. We also knew that since the early 1900s, the average IQ has generally been going up. And this has been the result of improvements in education, nutrition, and just quality of life in general. So this suggests to us that yes, the environment also plays a very important role, not just genes. Just on a side note though, is the average IQ still going up or are we getting dumber over time? This is a topic that I'll talk about in another video. So if you want to know what the answer is, don't forget to subscribe. But in a way, if you're one of those people who wasn't gifted with a high IQ, we know now, thanks to research, that there are things you can do to boost your IQ. And in fact, I'll quickly tell you my own story. When I was in school, I really struggled. I constantly felt like the dumb kid and everything that the teacher said just seemed like a blur to me. And sometimes I was so embarrassed about how dumb I was compared to all the other kids that I would even pretend to be sick um, as a way of just leaving school and going back home. Sometimes I was so mortified even just going up to the teacher and telling her that I was sick um, that I would actually just get a friend to do it for me. So that was in primary school. In high school, things started to get better, but I still had my challenges. So for instance, I really hated maths and funnily enough, my maths teacher probably really hated me because it was obvious that I was never paying attention. I also remember one of my other teachers writing in the report card to my parents that I wasn't a particularly gifted student. But here's the weird thing. I went to university and I kind of thrived. Um, so I studied a bachelor's degree in psychology and I was getting a high distinction in pretty much all of my subjects. And this helped me to get accepted into a, um, into an honors degree in psychology, which by the way is really competitive. In my honors degree, I managed to get a high distinction average and this allowed me to graduate with first class honors in psychology. Finally, at 25 years old, I was offered a PhD scholarship in statistics, um, just noting that PhD scholarships are very competitive as well. Um, and I was also offered my first uh, lecturing role in statistics. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a genius or that uh, these are exceptional achievements, um, just simply that considering how much I struggled in school, especially in primary school, I should not have been able to achieve these things. I think that the problem I had in school was that teachers were telling me what to learn and how to learn it. So for example, for your homework tonight, you have to complete these three questions from this textbook. Or to solve this equation, you have to do it this way. And I found as well that in school, they often don't tell you about other lifestyle factors that can help boost your ability to learn, such as talking about the importance of exercise, nutrition, and sleep. When I was at uni, I had total freedom to figure out how I learn best. So with what I'm about to present to you, these are based on a combination of research studies and also what worked best for me. Number one, train your working memory. Your working memory is your brain's capacity to keep track of information while solving a problem or processing something complex. Imagine trying to multiply 257 by 82. If you had a notebook, you could start by multiplying seven by two and writing down 14, then moving on to the next step. Now, imagine you don't have a notebook. This means you have to rely on your working memory uh, to memorize the number 14 while you try to solve the rest of the equation. This is a study that found that it is possible to improve your working memory. In particular, the researchers found that after participants were trained on a memory task, this improvement was still evident 
even when the participants were tested on entirely different reasoning tasks that they hadn't practiced before. How can you apply this? Consider playing Jewel and Back, which is what the researchers used in the study. And make sure to continually adjust the difficulty to your ability level. You should feel challenged, but not so challenged that you just feel overwhelmed and you want to give up. Now, if not Jewel and Back, at least some kind of mental exercise where you have to juggle multiple bits of information at the same time. Reading is another good example. Speaking of which, number two, read actively and widely. There are now less and less people reading books, which is sad because reading books is one of the simplest ways in which you can boost your intelligence. It's essentially a whole brain workout. When you read, you are activating several neural systems at the same time. And there is, of course, that every new word or idea in a book adds a new layer to your understanding of the world, giving your brain more mental tools to think with. Is this backed by research, though? Does reading really make you smarter? This study followed almost 2,000 pairs of identical twins from ages 7 to 16. The researchers found that the twin with better reading skills early on went on to have higher IQ scores later on. So yes, it does seem that reading can help boost your IQ. Number three, exercise regularly. When you exercise, especially aerobic exercise, such as running, cycling, or swimming, this helps to strengthen your white matter tracts. It also increases levels of BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps grow new neurons and strengthens the connections between them. Overall, this helps boost your cognitive intelligence. This is backed up by this meta-meta-analysis that found that exercise interventions can lead to moderate improvements in cognitive intelligence. And this was applicable across all age categories, and particularly in memory and executive function. Number four, sleep better. If you hear someone who is successful bragging that they only sleep three hours a night, don't listen to them. During sleep, the brain consolidates memories, strengthens neural connections, and clears out metabolic waste that builds up while we're awake. REM sleep, which is where dreaming takes place, supports creativity and problem solving by integrating new information with existing knowledge. So when you're sleep deprived, you start to miss out on these benefits, meaning that your working memory, attention, and reasoning start to decline. In fact, in this study of older adults, it was found that for those sleeping either less than four hours a night or more than 10 hours a night, experienced faster cognitive decline compared to those sleeping around seven to eight hours. And this is really interesting because not only does it tell us that sleep deprivation is really bad for our cognitive health, um, but it also tells us that oversleeping is as well. And if you're wondering, yes, this study did also factor in uh, certain underlying conditions that might have been impacting on both sleep and cognitive health, such as depression, diabetes, cancer. Number five, eat better. In general, aim for whole foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, and oily fish. This is because they contain antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids um, that support the structure of brain cells and help reduce inflammation. Omega-3s, for example, are essential for building the myelin sheath, uh, which is basically the fatty coating around axons that can help speed up communication between different brain regions. What about ultra-processed foods in particular, such as fast food and sugary drinks? This study followed more than 10,000 Brazilian adults for up to 10 years. The researchers tracked their dietary intake as well as measuring their cognitive performance over time. The researchers found that those who consumed the highest proportion of uh, their daily calories from UPF experienced significantly faster cognitive decline compared to those who ate less of these foods. And this association held even after adjusting for age, sex, education, and overall diet quality. So for example, people who are consuming a lot of UPF, but they're also eating a lot of the good stuff. Number six, reduce stress. When you go through stress, and by the way, this includes chronic loneliness, which can increase your stress, 
um, your body releases this stress hormone called cortisol. In excess, cortisol can actually shrink your hippocampus. If you didn't already know, the hippocampus is basically the brain's memory center. It can also weaken your prefrontal cortex, um, which you need for decision making, reasoning, and focusing. This study, published in 2023, followed participants for almost three decades, tracking their cognitive intelligence over time. The researchers found that those people who experienced high levels of stress in midlife experienced greater declines in verbal IQ, performance IQ, and overall IQ, compared to those with lower stress levels. Importantly, this effect held even after accounting for factors uh, such as education, early life circumstances, and personality traits such as neuroticism. Number seven, learn something new. When you try learning something new and novel, um, such as learning a new language, a musical instrument, or trying to solve a complex problem, it basically stimulates what's referred to as synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity is the strengthening and creation of new connections between neurons. Over time, this leads to more efficient communication between different brain regions. In this large randomized controlled trial, uh, in other words, an RCT, older adults were assigned to one of four groups, a memory training group, a reasoning training group, a processing speed training group, or a control group. In other words, this was a large study designed to test for causation. After just 10 sessions, each of the three training groups showed a significant improvement on the domain that they were trained on, and these improvements were observed even two years later. As for the control group, they didn't show any cognitive improvements. This study found that regular musical practice, at least 30 minutes a week, predicts higher scores on verbal ability and intellectual ability, and also higher scores for white matter tracks. And what about learning a language? This study followed adults as they learned a new language, and they used brain imaging to track what changed in their brains. The researchers found that language learning was linked with measurable increases in white matter connectivity. What's especially interesting though is that the researchers found that the brains of the language learners changed dynamically during the language learning process. Number eight, and this is my favorite one, rethink your thoughts. When you see a question like this, it's easy to panic. We often assume that to answer a question like this correctly is a sign that you're smart. So this puts pressure on you. If you get the question wrong, then it's easy to feel like this is a sign that you're dumb. Therefore, the first step is to not panic and remind yourself that if you don't get the question correct, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. Next, look for any clues that you can work with and you might find that there are actually more than you initially realize. Because there are so many blanks, we know that one of the letters is probably going to be a vowel. And as for the other letter, again, because there are so many blanks, it might be assumed that the other letter is the kind of letter that can be doubled. So it's probably not going to be Q, V, Y, W, you get the idea. What about over here? We can see I blank N. What do you think might go in between the I and N? Um, or what is a letter that typically goes in between these two letters? I would personally guess the letter O. Now, going to the very first letter, that's a P, it's probably safe to assume that our vowel, the letter O, comes after this P. So that means that if we're correct, the word starts with P-O. That means that so far we have spelt out po e ion po e ion I would like to see if you can figure out the rest. The point I'm making though is that sometimes you have to rethink your strategy. Don't expect the answer to just come at you in the one go. And especially if all you're doing is just staring at the problem. Look for clues, break the problem down into smaller pieces. Experiment with a solution. If it doesn't work, don't try to force it to work. Just chuck it, move on to the next one. What about with the next problem? What I would personally do is go through the squares and just describe what they're showing. Um, so we've got a triangle in a triangle, number two is showing um, lines intersecting in a triangle, number three is showing lines intersecting in a square, and as you work through each of these you can pick up on different characteristics. That's the hint that I'll give you, but I'll see if you can work out the rest. 
In psychology, this is referred to as metacognition, thinking about your thoughts. And this is what helped me the most when I was in university and trying to get good grades. It's not just a strategy that you can use for IQ-like questions, it's also a strategy that you can use for studying. If you're studying, rather than reading the same thing again and again, try coming up with a flowchart or explaining the concept to someone you know. In other words, keep experimenting until you figure out what works best for you. So those are the top eight things you can do to boost your IQ, or in other words, your cognitive intelligence. But it's worth keeping in mind that this isn't the only kind of intelligence. There's also creativity, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, to name just a few. And in some ways, IQ is a bit overrated, but this is something that I'll talk about in another video. So if you don't wanna miss out, remember to subscribe.